They called this mass meeting at the Loxley Baptist Church to stop winery legislation. Well, of course, it's a big misunderstanding. A lot of good folks thought that the wine bill that the governor was sponsoring was uh, going to allow all this drinking and frivolity and all that stuff, you know, wickedness. But the truth was, I told the governor that if he wanted to tax money, he had to pass the law and take the tax money and put it in the bank and buy school books so the next generation wouldn't be so uh, so dumb, you know. So, but the preachers didn't understand that. They thought it meant that uh, that you couldn't make wine, you know, it was going to let you make. Well, the ABC board was, was selling about a million and a half gallons of this rot gut every year, so that told me there's a pretty good market here, especially if you made better wine. So. That's kind of how we we got started with this. Television saved my backside. 11,000 people were invited to this meeting. So I tried to get the minister to, you know, don't do this. But he insisted he was going to stop it. So I told him, I said, tell you what I want to do. I'm going to come to church Sunday. And I'm going to sit right in front of the pulpit. And I said, now you get up in the pulpit and you call me anything derogatory other than Mr. Edmonds. I'm going to own this church association. And I said, you know who I am. You know, like I'm Satan personified, but the gentleman sitting next to me is going to be my attorney. And if you say anything about me other than Mr. Edmonds, he's going to own this association and collect all that money y'all collected all over the United States this month and next month till we break you. Well, these folks friends and neighbors, I didn't do that. I went and got all my buddies work for television stations, three channels. And I said, y'all wanna have some fun? Y'all come to church something and bring your cameras. So I notified the governor what was happening, so he flew the ABC administrator down here and all the legislators. Here we were all together in the house of God. TV crew plugged into the out in front of the pulpit and backed up and said, all right, y'all go ahead. And so, you know, the cameras were doing this number from whoever was talking to the pulpit and so forth. Well, that went all over the United States on AP News and whatever. And I got some of the funnest responses you wouldn't believe from all over the country about that, you know. <laughs> so anyhow, we, we got the legislation passed and we have Alabama's first farm winery here. And uh, so that was the first legislation that the new governor had enacted into law that year. That's the first time I'd ever done anything in 30 days, you know. Usually it might take three to five years to do something, but this time they, it's like a hot potato, you know, you knew they were either going to pass the law or they were going to throw it out, you know, so they voted to pass it. So here we are. So, you know, 45 years later, we're still doing it. I made a visit to the ABC board to buy a bottle of wine. They didn't have a decent bottle of wine. So I remembered these German and Italian farm, Greek farms here in Baldwin County, all these Immigrants, I don't know if they're legal or illegal, but a lot of them had, you know, armed forces, veterans, I mean, good people, farmers. They made their own wine and beer at the farmhouse, just like the law said. And of course, the, the ethnicity of all this was, see, the, uh, most of the talk in Montgomery is about uh, another church. See, the Catholic Church served real wine, like Jesus made at the at communion, you know, so. There's just some folks who just couldn't handle that. So what I had done at that meeting was read the Bible to them about the Lord turning the wine into water into wine, you know. So I mean that everybody knows that story. So it kind of went from there. So we've been making it ever since. And we keep trying to catch up with California. Because they got some good wine out there. They can find winemakers. But see they had 
favorable legislation. They you know, made a huge industry. But over here, uh, like that's illegal. Uh, you can't do it. So not only do we make wine, we make vinegar. That's world class vinegar. Three international awards for vinegar. Now one of them is a gold medal for a malt vinegar. I make it from three breweries that were bankrupted in Alabama. Just to show them what you can do with something that you, they thought they were going to throw it away. So you just convert it to something else that's good. Go and you sell it. Okay? Marinate your meat. Barbecue. So that's why we that's why we do. We make lemonade out of lemons. Yeah, so that's why you see non-alcoholic products here and alcoholic products. Well, first off, a lot of misunderstanding. There's only two general species of grapes in the entire world. One species is Muscadinia, Native American grapes. The other one is Uvitis. That's Latin for European vine. See, when in the time of Noah, uh, he planted a vineyard after the flood, made wine, got drunk, took a nap. They brought those vines over here when they said they discovered America. Well, see, some of us people were already here, and we had a grape that we called Scuppernod. That's the Indian word that meant sweet tree. Like you could go over there and pick that fruit. But the Indians were not the winemakers, the Europeans were the winemakers. So our original American wines made and produced in this country were made from the muscadine grapes. And uh, so this goes past folks that don't know much about their history in the United States. In 1880, the U.S. Census showed Alabama as the eighth largest wine producing state in the nation. Over 12,000 acres of grapes growing here, made world class wines. I learned about this when I went to University of California at Davis from their top scientists. And I told him what I was doing. He said, well, you're making the wrong thing. 14% or less table wine. He said, you need to be making brandy and champagne. He said, that's a superior brandy grape. Well, he's a scientist, world known. I'm just a you know, novice. I don't, I don't really appreciate what he was telling me. But the muscadine grape, there are other varieties of them. The Concord grape, probably one of the best. Every kid in the country has been raised on Welch's Concord grape jelly and peanut butter sandwiches and Welch's grape juice. That's a muscadine grape. An old textbook referred to as northern muscadine. And then we have southern muscadine. What that means is the plants up north, say like Tennessee Lion North, they've adapted to freezing and thawing conditions. The ones here have adapted to hot and humid conditions. But these grapes have been here for thousands of years. And the good news is, it's the healthiest fruit on the earth. The antioxidant level of these muscadine grapes is in the order of 1,600 to 1,800 parts per million. One antioxidant cell will kill one cancer cell. That's pretty powerful. So for degenerative diseases, heart disease, diabetes, arthritis, cancer, maybe they ought to be drinking more muscadine wine. But, you know, the, the good winemakers out on the West Coast, they, they specialize in Chardonnay and Cabernet, these well-known grapes. What we're doing here using politics and religion had suppressed it, destroyed the scientific knowledge, okay? It was regarded as just a wild plant, like it was some kind of exotic jungle fruit, you know? Uh -uh. The reason these grapes look like they do is because they're under so much environmental stress. And, uh, but when you control the diseases 
and you learn how to work with it, it makes an exceptional wine and brandy and champagne. And so we have reason to be proud. Now that book over there that Kathy just brought in, it was just printed and issued in December, published by the California Wine Institute. And I would like to tell California folk, we appreciate that. They recognize that the Southeast United States, which has been backward since Prohibition, is now catching up and receiving due recognition for the wines that result here. My second day back home after in 71, after the Vietnam War began to uh, wind down, I decided to come back to Alabama. And nobody offered me a job, invited me back. I just showed up, you know. And she wanted a bottle of wine. And uh, of course, in Alabama at that time, what we had was wines were sold in the state ABC stores, the Monopoly. And the choice was very poor. And so I knew that she was familiar with good wines, like in New York City. And I didn't want to just be embarrassed totally, you know, with a new wife. And so, but she insisted, so I took her to the ABC store to select a bottle of wine. And what we got was just the dregs in the bottom of the tank, you know, as, as being a marketable wine. And she spit it out. And I went back and asked for a better bottle or to get my a refund. And the manager of the store just looked at me and he said, you sinners deserve it. Well. For this old Marine, that was just the wrong thing to say. And I grabbed him by what we called a stacking swivel, hiked him up and said, I'm not a second-rate citizen. Now you go back in the back and get me a better bottle of wine or give my money back or I'm fixing to put a whipping on your backside. So he didn't have a better bottle of wine, so give him three bucks back, so that launched the wine venture here. So the third day back home in Alabama, I bought a hundred acres of land and proceeded to plant a vineyard to make some wine to, for that girl to get a bottle of wine. So she's been down here about 50 years now and uh, we just celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary back in January. So uh, this kind of goes back a little ways, you know. I didn't make a plan to do this. It just was kind of happenstance, you know, reactionary. And so I don't apologize for being young and impetuous, you know, a uh, little, bit, little bit wiser now, you know, might not have done that. But anyway, Alabama's first farm winery is history now. My first exposure to the science of fermentation occurred at the United States Naval Academy. I had three jugs of fresh apple cider that I had bought on a Sunday afternoon out in the, on a country road, you know, temperature about 20 degrees, it was just slushy. I mean, delicious, but I brought it inside with the heat and overnight it fermented and blew the jugs up and burned all my uniforms. It cost me about three months pay just to clean my uniform. So, not only did I discover fermentation and the carbon dioxide that would, can make a, a bottle turn into a hand grenade, I found out that when I tried to air out the room, so that, cause it made the whole building smell like a brewery. I opened the window and about a zillion fruit flies came in and covered my uniform. So this sticky apple cider plus the fruit flies presented a problem for the cleaning, uh, dry cleaners. But as soon as I got commissioned in the Marine Corps, I found myself down in Camp de June and housing was scarce and I was sharing a, a camp house with a young Marine Sergeant from up in the western hills of North Carolina. I called him Sergeant Hillbilly. Well, Sergeant Hillbilly had this job in motor transport. He'd go out and take the Marines out in the woods every day on exercises and all day long he had nothing to do except guard his vehicle so he would pick any kind of wild fruit that was out there. And he and I got to fermenting it, you know, and we made our own. We didn't have enough money to go to PX and buy store-bought stuff, but we got alcohol, you know, so we'd work hard for it, so we drank it. 
and then camp, around Camp Lejeune, east of North Carolina, that's where the history of wine in this country really began. It was not California. See, California was over 3,000 miles west. The Europeans that came to the eastern shore of the, the, of the Atlantic, the middle of the Atlantic states, had grapes growing lush. They knew how to make wine. So the Indians were saying, Scarpadon, a phonetic language, several spellings of it, but what that meant was sweet tree to the immigrant visitors. You could go and pick fruit, enjoy. Well, the visitor, oh my God, we never seen grapes like this in our lives, you know? So that first thought was, we'll make wine and send it back to Europe and trade it in for gunpowder or some such. So the history of wine in the United States happened in that area. So in my formative years of coming up through that in North Carolina and other places, see, before Prohibition, North Carolina and Georgia were the leading wine producing states in the United States. It was not California and New York. So when I get a book like that over there, published by the Wine Institute that says, yea, verily, they have good wines in the Southeast United States, uh, I clap. I'm not trying to be treasonous, I just clap. And in there, they listed alphabetically for the wineries that produce fortified dessert wines. Bonita Vineyards is the first one in the list in Alabama. And way back in the back in Virginia, they got Trump Winery listed. So, you know, we've arrived. So, uh, we like to share that with people. And uh, so, how did we get started and where did it lead to? We're still traveling that road. Uh, so, the brandies and other fancy liqueurs are coming along. You know, that takes time. And you have to be patient and let nature do what it does. See? So the wines that won the awards this year, I began making those wines 12 years ago. But I learned from the folks in California. See, they're ahead of us in the knowledge because They've had a business climate and legislation that allowed them to develop an industry that's now leaders in the world. We don't have that here. We have what's called a three-tier system. And the first sentence in the law says you can't sell it. So if you can't sell what you make, it's like sort of out of business, you know? So we made world-class vinegars. So we do both. So, that just kind of explains not only how to get into it, but what we're still doing. See, it's, it's, a, it's a progression. It doesn't, it's ancient science. It has a long and varied history that I would call politics, religion, and immigration. Today we have high speed, bottling lines and such as that in California. This equipment was it bottled wine for the state for 30 years when they I bought it and I bought it and I've run it for 30 years. So this equipment that's still bottling wine is as old as me and you. And uh, so still useful. I got it from a contractor who was bottling wine for the Alabama ABC board. And they ceased business uh, due to transportation and all other kind of factors. Wine was typically shipped from California in bulk form, like tank cars, and offloaded, then bottled for the consumers in the stores. And so Alabama, being a controlled state, they bought from the wineries in California, and they would have contractors that would operate equipment like this to bottle the wines to go in ABC stores. And uh, so when Mr. Gallo built a glass plant, started bottling his own wine so he could improve the quality to ship over here, that got rid of all this local bottling of wines, okay, totally different kind of thing, to improve the quality of wine. So about the time I started in the, in the late 70s, 
Uh, there was a revolution going in this industry called the farm winery laws. So that's why we're called an Alabama farm winery. The new legislation that permitted us to grow grapes and make wine and sell it. And that went on until about 2001. And so we've had about three decades of very conservative thinking in this state, one of which was get rid of wineries. None of this gambling and none of this uh, alcohol making, all right? Well, I was afraid they'd make it too illegal and I'd have to give up farming, see, because I would take, spend good money for fertilizer and throw it out there on the ground, hoping I'd win, okay? And uh, that's a big gamble. See, there's no insurance or like that. So, hair canes and droughts and floods, insects, they'll get to you, you know, but we survive and we, we keep doing things that uh, overcome that. So, you know, that's just farming. They have some of this out in California. I mean, that's heartbreaking to read about the fires in the vineyards out there. Uh, we've not had a fire here. We had one, I'm sorry, they burned five acres. Uh, but mostly hurricanes have done us a lot of damage. But the, it doesn't kill the grapevine. It's just they're on the ground tangled up and it's hard to manage. So uh, we can't get our mechanical harvesters and things into the field. So we, you know, not complaining. That's just part of it, you know. And so uh, we got wine in our tank, so we survive it. So, that's, uh, you have to live about two lifetimes to run a winery. You know, it takes a long time. And uh, you get used to the contingency of agriculture and the acts of God, you know, I mean, I understand that. But the problems that we get dealing with man, I have very little patience, like monopoly. Or you can't sell it, or you can't do this, or you can't have a drink. Well, you know, we're listening to it now, where you, you can't buy a drink until you're 21, but you can buy an AR-15. And so I have some misgivings about some of that, you know. Uh, it just kind of tugs at my, my heartstrings, you know, just a little bit. Because when I went in the military, the Korean War, uh, I couldn't buy a drink either. And I wondered about that, you know. that. Uh, so it kind of gives you a, a little more balanced point of view sometimes, you know, that's a little inconsistent with the extreme rights and lefts of these things. So philosophy is part of it, you know, why making this art, law, economics, engineering, science, and a whole lot of praying. Uh, but the good Lord put it here for our health and well-being, and so we learn. And it's good to listen to the old heads that make the wines, have lived through it, they know. Make good people, make friends. So we like to share that. And that's what we do every day around here. So yeah, we had to learn and it was pretty crude. I can't, I can't say, see I didn't get formal education in this. I went to school and learned to be an engineer. That made me impatient. You know, uh, as one fellow said to my dad, he said, Jim's got to learn that Rome wasn't built in a day. And my dad says that's only because he wasn't there. <laughs> so we built this winery in three and a half weeks because we had ministers and politicians and bankers telling us that you can't do it. So we just did it anyway. We make 19 different wines. Most of them are table wine, meaning 14% or less. We have fortified wines, like I just talked about, which is the dessert wines. And we've, in season and certain times, we've made ciders, you know, uh, low alcohol wines, you know, uh, apple, satsuma, orange, grape, so blueberry. So the full spectrum, you know. And we have the, the natural juice, that's zero alcohol, out to 100%. We also make biofuels. So if you look at that spectrum, zero to a hundred percent 
on alcohol production. This is ancient science. 2% sugar with yeast converts to 1% alcohol. And then when the state says you can't do it, I just exposed it to excess oxygen with a little yeast and made world-class vinegars. So the vinegars are mirror image of the wines. So we have other types of vinegars made from vegetables like tomato, and our best one was made from cucumbers. Gold medal, second place in world competition, called gherkin essig. So not only can you have a good red wine with your steak, marinated in one of our vinegars, you can have a good dressing on your salad. So we like fine dining. And, and you can tell that, that I'm a real supporter of that. Three times a day.